So onwards, we are now going to have a panel of folks who were there at the demo, led by Jeff Rulofsson. Jeff, come on up here. And do we have some of your other panelists here? I lost them in the audience. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Martin, Han, Han, So Charles, we've got Christina. Jeff, uh, Don Andrews, Martin Hardy, uh, Charles Irby, and then I think Christina's going to make a special guest appearance at some point. So please uh, come up now, Christina. Come on up, folks. So uh, we're going to move from Gardner's eloquent <clears throat> talk about the, the, uh, what I call the Joe paper, the conceptual framework, into the sort of um, low-level bits and bites. How so we so all work. of you who don't know, who, who here is, doesn't, isn't a close friend to Jeff's? <laughs> so let me explain <laughs> to you, them. for those who are not, this is the I'm not real good at pool, but I like to play for money line. Yes. So yeah. let's get your panelists up here. Come yeah, on up come and on up. have a seat. Come on up. Um, yeah, I, uh, I actually came in uh, in um, January of 1966. And uh, Martin, when did you join us? When did you? It was around, I'm not sure, but it, it was around just when he was moved to the new building and they were coming oh, on. Oh, so you were a little after me. Yeah. And Don was here before me. Uh, yeah, October 66. I think I was there. I had joined us. No, right October '66. No, '65. <laughs> Must have been. Christina, uh, we were still in the, uh, we were still in the wooden buildings. You, you, I yeah, and I, I came when we were right in between. We'll, we'll get to Charles yeah. later, and, and I think Christina was in middle school. <laughs> was that right? I, I was 13. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So um, what we're going to do is is just sort of try to set the framework of what computing was like at the time, what we had to build, a little bit about how we build it, built it, what happened on the day of the demo, and, uh, and then sort of what happened with the group uh, as we went on after that. So um, one of the first, let's, let's start way back <clears throat> when Doug moved from the conceptual framework paper to his first attempt at, at trying to get some augmentation for uh, document editing. And, and he did that. He had a little control data machine called a 160A that I never programmed on. But uh, you did some work on it, I think, Don. I tinkered with the, what he called it the offline system. There was an offline system, which allowed you to do editing by essentially making commands and a bunch of tape that got processed later. And the online system, which um, at that time, there was an implementation, when I joined, there was an implementation on the CDC 3100 with, I think you've seen pictures of it in some of the reports with it, one huge round uh, display. And it was a dedicated system. Uh, that is one user on the 3100. And the, he was trying to promote the offline system as well, which was very difficult because they were structured documents. So if what you wanted to do was add some text to it, to a document, that was fairly simple. You could create a punch tape that would then get processed and add that content to the document. But if you wanted to do some editing, it got very uh, convoluted. So, so let, let me go a little deeper. So the idea <laughs> was that you sat at a Model 33 teletype, and you, and you typed control characters and text, and you created your document, and then and then when you wanted to edit your document, you, you would run this through the CDC 160A and you'd get a printout. And then if you wanted to edit the document, you'd take the printout, go back to a Model 33 teletype, and punch a new paper tape with editing commands to edit the paper document. And, and as Don said, you could add to the document, but I don't know that anybody could actually use it effectively to edit a document. <laughs> Uh, it was quite confusing and very difficult. Um, and then I came in uh, January of 66. We had a CDC 3100. Um, and, and not, I mean, barely a, a system that you could edit anything on, really. It was mainly just a text editor, but it had structure, structure yeah. to the files. Yeah. And that's the system they did the time and motion studies for the pointing devices on. They had several pointing devices 
I don't know if you were involved in any of them. No, I wasn't. No. There was one that worked under the table that was on your knee right. and moved a spot on the screen, and another one that, that they had a, it was a commercially available um, light pan, which you held up to the screen and pushed a button, and it sensed the um, cathode ray uh, right. synchronized. Uh, so there's the famous um, NASA report on pointing devices. Uh, the project was administered through NASA, but was actually funded by Bob Taylor that you saw the little video of. Uh, and it was a contract with Doug to try to figure out with NASA what, de what kind of a pointing device one could put in a space capsule. Uh, and, and although the mouse actually sort of won all the tests for the fastest, most accurate movement, you couldn't have a mouse in a space capsule. So trackballs is what NASA adopted. Uh, and then, and then right about that time, well, there was a, a small period after that where um, Bob Taylor had the idea of doing the 68 demo. And uh, Doug would take me around the country to help sell this to other people associated with ARPA and ARPA program managers and whatnot. And I think we got approval for the 940 in late 66 or so. That's where it got installed. Hmm? That's about when it came, came on board. And yeah, yeah, and then started bringing people like Martin in to get it to all go. And, and we had a pretty clear vision from a software viewpoint about where we wanted to go with this, which Don was a very big part of. Um, you might talk about the command, how the command meta language started. Then I'll tell him what that let me, all means. Let me give a little, bit, a little bit more background, because it, um, it all can be Googled and searched. But basically, at that time, uh, computers were used for number crunching primarily, either um, like freezing a space mission, uh, computing orbits, or doing scientific calculations. And there was really no thought of using computers interactively or for anything other than maybe business uh, computations as well as scientific computations. Um, so the support for someone who wanted to do system programming uh, was virtually non-existent in terms of development kits and compilers and, and support software. Uh, so. Um, the tools that we had available. The 3100 system was actually written in assembly language and was a monolithic system that probably had features added on one by one and was very, very unworkable. So we, being young computer scientists who were trained in proper software construction and modular, pro modular approaches and that sort of thing, um, basically were faced with starting from scratch without a lot of set of, a lot of set of tools to help us with that. So uh, several of us were um, familiar with some work that we done at the uh, Association, Association for Computing Machinery Special Interest Group in LA, which had developed syntax-directed uh, compiler writing systems, um, which we had experience with before we actually joined Doug's group. And the, one of the key things was a uh, program called Meta2, which was a syntax-directed compiler that defined the syntax of a language that you wanted to create, and embedded in there were output instructions to produce the code to implement the action of that program that you wrote. Um, and the key thing about this compiler is it was written in its own language, so it could compile itself. Uh, one of the striking uh, things about this was the, the Meta2 compiler, written in its own language, fit on one page. So you could get your arms around it. It was hard to get your head around it, but you could get your arms around it. <laughs> uh, and it turned out that we, we began using derivatives of things that we developed based on that for um, control languages and software languages. And one of the stories about the uh, command languages, uh, one of my first days, Doug sat down with me and said, 
you see what we're trying to do here. We have a set of commands, and the user acts interactively with the computer. We'd like to be able to sit down and define that interaction in a very flexible way, to define what the commands are, the feedback, how you make selections, in a, in a more formal way than, than actually writing the program to make it happen, so that we can develop new systems and experiment and do studies on them and so forth. And having messed with these uh, meta-languages and compiler writing systems, um, you know, when you have a hammer, the world looks like a nail. So I began to think, this is an application for a meta-language. A meta-language <coughs> would de define a set, it would be used to be able to define a set of command languages that you could use for different tools and subsystems in the NLS system. Um, and the, so we essentially created that command language. And uh, one of the interesting things about that was inadvertently and without really, I think, understanding the whole consequences of it, uh, we separated the interactive and command part of the system from the actual functional part of changing the file system because in the command language you sat down you wrote the set of commands and you wrote down how to make the selections and at the end you invoked a function to actually make that uh, command take place and that made it very easy later in our work to separate the interactive part and the actual functional part and we had systems later on where that was actually implemented on separate computers so you had the interaction very close in a high-speed computer, very close to the user, maybe small, smaller, and the larger back-end computer somewhere else would actually take care of the command execution. And you see that even today with browsers or smart applications running on your phone or your laptop, and the actual command execution and file storage is on, it's in the cloud somewhere. So there's a whole, we could do a day workshop over the next two years, we built, we had, uh, we started with this very simplistic Meta 2 system, and we built a Meta compiler. This was a compiler that would compile compilers. And we built programming languages then, compilers for programming languages. We built a special one for the SDS 940. We had the command Meta language, and we eventually built the Meta compiler up to this very powerful thing called Tree Meta. And uh, using that system, bootstrapped from the 3100 to the 940 and got the demo going. It's a long story. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's sort of move forward. So Martin uh, played a lot of integral roles in, the, um, in getting the hardware behind this going. Because um, on the 940, you know, these were very, very primitive, very small, very slow machines. And, uh, we, the 940 was a time-sharing machine, and we could actually support, as I recall, about eight people uh, running on the 940, running NLS simultaneously. And, and so we had to do things like mouse tracking, which were just unheard of. And we had special keyboards that we needed interfaces to. Mm -hmm. and, and Martin had a lot to do with that. But there's one thing, there's one aspect. Uh, well, you saw a little bit of the demo tape. So on the day of the demo, Doug was in... Uh, uh, the Civic Auditorium in San Francisco. And Don and I and, and one of our colleagues, Bill Paxton, were in the SRI Engineering Building in Menlo Park. Uh, and, and as you saw, the video conferencing was actually shared. So I could, Doug could see me in a corner of the screen, and I could see him, and, and he could see what I was working on, or I could see what he was working on. And how that happened was sort of black magic. It, it's never actually been documented. So <laughs> I, I'm serious. I, I could not find any write-up about how the video links worked and stuff like that. And I'd like Martin to actually talk about that a little. Yeah. And, and I show some, your slide, too, if you want. slides, but one of the things I wanted <clears> to say was that in the keyboard, the NLS keyboard, we actually added a meta key, another one to give you the eighth bit so you can expand the the character words, so uh, that was uh, another addition. <clears throat> so 
I have some slides that show that I have put together that show how everything was connected, the audio, the video, and the mouse and key set, how they came up, back, up, and down, and, and uh, we're up, okay. And what I wanted to say was, here's, here's Doug in the middle, and, and when we did that demo, the result of that was this picture here. This is a standing ovation to Doug after yeah. the demo, and you can see how many people were there. It was a pretty big crowd. So I think there were about 2,000 people in the audience. Wow. <laughs> I, can, I can put the picture up and you can count them. So this is a layout I did that has, uh, over here in the left-hand upper corner is the different communication devices that were uh, from San Francisco to Menlo Park. We had two modem systems uh, up in the upper top here, and they were for voice and, and the, the uh, mouse and key set and keyboard uh, information to go up and down that Doug had at his console. And then we had two data links. One was a down link for Doug's, uh, Doug's face, and particularly, and to put on the screen of the one of the, of the machine in, in Menlo Park. And the other one was an uplink of the screen and two other cameras that mixed in uh, for Doug and for Bill English, who sat in the background to communicate with. So I'll show you these diagrams so you can see the first one. Well, let me go back here. I'll show you the mess of it all first, uh, this one here. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and then here, here is, uh, before we go back, here's the 940. That's what it looked like in the front end when it was all pretty. And back here is uh, the interface for the mouse and key set was this uh, communication device, and that's Bill English looking at it. And we had a bunch of, there was a bunch of lights in the top where we tried to figure out things, what was going wrong. There were lots of things that went wrong all the time. So here's where we spent time. This is uh, Ed Van Der Reet and myself uh, in those days. And we're trying to do all this wire wrapping, debugging that was on the back of the character generator. And that was a, always a nightmare. And the camera system, which we ended up with, with um, this is a setup when we first started that shows you two. They were a pair. And in the memory, it scanned them in pairs. If we go up to 16 was the ideal that we could it could handle, and it would do two by two by two. It switched through, and the and the screens were, had a long persistence, so they would hold the image until it came back around and scanned again. And and the character generator was one that was was an, we were in the analog world then, right? Basically, uh, there was no ADD converters really, unless you made everything up out of resistors and stuff yourself. Uh, that didn't happen until uh, until it came out with the 4004 when they started doing it in, in logic. And so the, the characters were drawn with, with uh, resistors and capacitors uh, that moved the current on the screen of the, of the CRT to a position. And all that was done by the language, the program language, that would know what the person wanted and put it in the right place. And then the screen would, the character generator would draw it there. So Doug was able to have a, language, have a code that he could move the text over to his different spot, and then we could fade in uh, the image from uh, down in Menlo Park. So that worked really well. Um, so go back up here to the sound system, I mean, the mouse and key set. It ran through an interface box, which is a red box in the middle here, and down through the 1200 baud uh, modems, and we thought that well, Doug said, oh, 1,200 baud's a fat. You can't read faster than 1,200 baud, 120 <laughs> characters per second. That was kind of wrong. But uh, <laughs> now if we went back to 1,200 baud, I'm sure everybody would get up and Google would be in big trouble. So, um, so that's what we did. And that worked uh, quite fine in, the, in this particular case. And uh, the voice system, which is we had so that everybody can communicate was pretty extensive. We had Bill English up in the back, in the back room behind the screen, running the monitor and stuff. And this was kind of what his command was. But this is at SRI. Stuart Brad there in his corner, and, and uh, 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 Bates uh, over in the corner. Um, so 
and this is where we practice. This was Bill's platform for practicing to do game. everything to make it all work. It's not to be. Uh, and we had the Ida 4, which is the projector, which they borrowed and begged and borrowed and kept when we were supposed to send it back. And <laughs> oh, that's the wrong picture. Sorry about that. <laughs> and then we had the workstation down below, and there was a big room we had, and there was one of the sets that was here, and we we could show it and display everything. And the Ida 4 was quite a quite a machine. And then at the command center down there, there was me monitoring and, and a couple of other guys monitoring all the data stuff that was going around. And somehow it all worked. So we <laughs> survived that. So uh, <laughs> thank you. So I have. <coughs> and then I, the big thing was uh, any questions or? Well, I have, I have, a, I have a question. We're going we're to. I don't think we're set up for questions for the audience. But the, the um, link from, from th this was all do using microwave. Yeah. So Well, the, the, what I've talked about so far was the modems. They were just telephone. Right, modems. right, right. But the video links were all mic yeah, were microwave links. Here. Yeah. And um, so you had to put a repeater in someplace in order to That's correct. get line of sight down to. Yeah down to San Francisco. Where was the repeater? That was up in, on Skyline. So they were up in the hills so where they can get that link to go up. So we beamed from the SRI roof up to Skyline and then back down. Yeah. And I don't depict that here. It's just, I just show the one link yeah. going all the way down. But it, I do by showing that there's three connections. You can see the center one has the link in between, which means that they were, that was a repeater of these two here. So, that, so that's, yeah. Go ahead. OK. So the way that worked is that it, it was pretty complicated. I, you know, 50 years ago, trying to remember all this stuff, and hopefully I got it right. In fact, earlier, uh, during one of Bill's conversation, he couldn't remember either, and he thought we had three. But we really only had two uh, microwave links, because we had, these, we had these video mixers that could do everything, basically. We had this one here, which took the signal, got the signal from the display that uh, Jeff had here at, at, in Menlo Park, and it also fed, and then that fed into a mixer which had connected to Bill's, which controlled the, the t camera that was on the top of the, up high above Doug, so they can zoom in on the keyboard. And we had another camera <coughs> inside with the zoom into his face. And then the, the Ida 4 projector was, was fed from that on the live feed on the output. And Doug's screen was fed that way, too. And then a feedback from that one camera went also back down the Menlo Park into another mixer that fed here, that fed uh, Jeff's screen so they could fade in and out uh, Doug's, Doug's image in the background. And then, then Stuart had, was manning this camera, which we called the room camera, so he could, he could scan all around the room. That would go up in the mixer. They could determine who, whether the face camera or the room camera was the dominant source going up to, to Doug. And when Doug said, you know, switch it to the face, they would go to the mixer and change that over. It was preset, but it was basically the way that was. So, uh, so it was kind of complicated, and, and, but it all came together uh, and worked, uh, which uh, was quite phenomenal <laughs> in itself. But. And then some of these guys uh, we have here, let's see, go back to this guy. The sound system. Oh, over here. And by the way, what I'm using here is Doug's thing of hyperlinks. These are all hyperlink points that I've been picking up and showing the pictures, et cetera, et cetera, the same concept. So yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a tribute, I feel, to, to Doug that uh, this all kind of works. <laughs> So, I don't know, is there any other questions? Or? No, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Let's move forward. <laughs> Thank you. So, the, the video that you saw of Doug, um, there, there was a, um, are the screens, well, wait. there was a video, uh, not a video, a film made off the screens by just taking one of these video feeds uh, that was, and it was filmed at SRI. And um, after, after the, the film was shot at 24 frames per second. And, the, and there were a couple of things that happened. I'll tell you about one of them. Uh, 
during the demo that have been lost. Uh, after the demo, I went around for quite a while showing this film various places, and we had a special projector made that uh, you, could, you, could, you could stop it or you could run it in slow motion, and I could flick through the projector one film frame at a time without burning the film up. It was a pretty big deal. Uh, and, and one day I found a single frame in, in the videotape that showed that the system had crashed. And it used to crash so often that we worked with the guys at Berkeley and we put a lot of energy into very, very fast recovery. And so it would crash and it would recover very quickly. And if there was only one person on it, evidently it reco recovered in less than a 24th of a second. So, so, and that's a part of the history that's been lost now because the MPEG converters, when they went from video to, the, to this kind of stuff, have lost that frame. It's only in the film. Uh, okay, so Charles, you were actually there. Yes, I was in the audience, and uh, I came in a little bit late, and the place was just packed. I, I recall standing along a wall because there were no seats left. Um, as you saw in the picture that was shown a moment ago, it's, it was quite a big room, and the, the Idafor was having quite a bit of difficulty. You can see it flickering, almost on the verge of failing. Yeah, but a big uh, generator. When you think about the state of the art at that time in the late 60s, the fact that Ed and, and Bill, Bill English and others were able to put this all together, um, it's just astonishing. It's just absolutely astonishing. They don't get nearly, the, the hardware guys don't get nearly the credit that they deserve right. to pull this off. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I was at a point where I was working on a, a ground control system for a precursor to the Skylab. And at that time, just to give you a feeling for what user interface was like then, this was on a huge console, you know, about the size of a small room, uh, with a little display, and the keyboard had physical, uh, what they called overlays, that you plugged in on top. That's how you change from one set of functions to another, is you plugged in a new overlay on the thing, and you push the buttons through the overlay. And that, that was the state of computing. That was advanced computing. Yeah. It was so advanced, it never got actually completed. <laughs> but uh, I walked into that room with the context of what computing was at that point in time, which was essentially ballistics and business processing. That was kind of almost everything that was being done. And to see what Doug and his team had put together was just so mind-expanding. It, it's very, very hard to, to describe it to people. But what I, well, the effect it had on me personally was that I uh, immediately after the demo sought out uh, Bill English, since Doug had mentioned him in the, con in the uh, session, and uh, talked to him all, all about how everything worked and, and asked him if he had any need for programmers. <laughs> and uh, about two months later, I was working there. So it was uh, quite a remarkable thing. And uh, again, I, I think it's just, it's just so hard I came, to a, 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 I came to Litton Industries where I was doing this other project from UC Santa Barbara where I was working in uh, Glenn Culler's computer research lab. And as far as I know, that was the only other interactive system that was in, in being at that time. The displays on, on this system were about the size of a suitcase with a little screen about that big. And all you could do was you could draw on it arbitrary XY graphics, but you couldn't erase it. All you could do is wipe the whole thing clean and start over again. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. It was an Etch-a-Sketch, exactly. Uh, electronically controlled Etch-a-Sketch. And uh, so we, we did that, and we were very proud of what we had done. But that was the only thing I knew of that was anything even remotely like that. And to see the step from that to what Doug's team had done was just really amazing. Just, Totally amazing, and I felt I just had to be part of yeah. it. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, I want to say when Don was talking about those days when he was writing the compiler and it was a one-page thing, even in the 70s, early 70s, uh, before uh, the chips were you know, dominant, the people were writing code in assembly language, and I had split off from SRI and Rodney Bondurant over here uh, 
was working for me, and he was writing, he wrote a word processor, and I don't know if anybody remembers WordStar, uh, and it, we were doing indentations and stuff, and all that program doing the whole word process ran in out of 8-bit memory in a full one page. And at that time, they came out with a small disk. They were, they were uh, a dollar a bit, so a 5K disk cost $5,000. So the NLS workstation sold for $5,600 a station, a workstation with the mouse. He said the mouse was $200 or $250, I think, to, to build. All analog, because there was no, until the, four, the 4004 came out, you couldn't make a, a cheap, inexpensive ADD converter. It was several hundred dollars in a big box, and that chip was just a little dinky thing. And we piled them together to get eight bits, and, and, most, and that worked for digitizing the mouse at that time. After this demo, when we came to the line processor and the PDP-10 to do the time sharing, where we can get a, analog, a digital signal directly into the to the computer without having to do all this conversion. And so, you know, it was a big time. It was, it was hard to do all that stuff because it was either binary or wires of resistors and, and uh, transistors at that time, so. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we only have 13 minutes left. Let, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, let me, let, me, let me clear that up. So the Fall Joint Computer Conference was officially held in Brooks Hall. And um, Brooks Hall is the large conference space uh, above the parking lot uh, in Civic Center in San Francisco. Across the street from Brooks Hall is the Civic Auditorium. So the official addresses of the Fall Joint Computer Conference was the Civic Auditorium. The demo was actually held in the Civic Auditorium. It's now called the Bill Graham Civic Auditorium. Before that, it was the Civic Auditorium. Before that, it was used for the opera or something in San Francisco. And before that, it was used for the Warriors basketball um, building. Uh, it goes way back into the 1930s. No. It was, no, that's wrong then. It was in the Civic Auditorium. I know, I'm, <laughs> I was up there many times before. The pictures in the film actually match the stage in the Civic Auditorium. It was. Okay. <laughs> I, the rest of the story is I had always called it Brooks Hall. And I thought it was actually in Brooks Hall. And I was, there was another film that was made last summer uh, about Doug and all of this stuff. And I was, I went up with the film crew, because I'm in the, a lot of the film, and I went up with the film crew and we got the, the um, um, property manager for San Francisco to let us into Brooks Hall, and he took us under the parking lot. And I said, oh, this isn't where the demo was. And so he took us across the street and showed us the stage, and then we had to go back and clean up the wiki pages and get everything historically correct. <laughs> okay, so I've used a lot of time in that. We have to skip the... Um, so, so after the... This, after the demo, uh, with the, the group grew quite a bit. And they made a transition from the 940 to the PDP-10. And there's a long story about how that bootstrapping worked because we had all these meta compilers and that compiled the compilers and we had our own tool set and they were able to map it over very fast. But the important thing I want to get to um, is, is how the, the group then made the system available over the ARPANET, amazingly enough, uh, to user groups uh, that, that ARPA sponsored. So would you talk about that a little bit, Christina? Sure. I think, um, let's see. So in the group, so Dad's original idea was that uh, to make the world a better place, that requires a collective effort. And so that requires organizations. And so the first prototype organization that would learn how to do that uh, was the lab, because it turned out that when you're when you're prototyping those capabilities you were prototyping, that uh, you could be your own subject of the test. And that gave a really fast feedback loop and everything. But his idea always was to scale that to out to networks and out to organizations. And so um, in 1967, when 
Bob Taylor at ARPA was um, announced, he brought his uh, principal investigators together to announce that they were gonna go ahead and do this ARPANET thing and that they would be sharing resources across these mainframes that were being funded in different, in different places. And so the story is, and I, this is confirmed by Bob and my father, is that my dad was like, oh boy, that's great. And everybody else sort of backed up. Because <laughs> they were like, why would we want to share our resources on our computer? So there was a big sort of tussle, but dad was really adamant about that's exactly the way to go. And we could offer this, what we're doing and how we're working over the network and also get out into more organizations. And so, some of the first organizations who were using it were the funding organizations, so ARPA, and actually that's how I first met Vince Cerf, because he was using NLS at the ARPA office in the IPTO. And the Romero Development <coughs> Center, which was also funding at the time, um, the uh, ARPA agent there was, was using it and they were trying to you know, bring it into the organization. So dad had this idea that to bring it into an organization, you don't just go put it out to everybody. You find the people who are gonna be the ones to shepherd it in. They're the architects of, of how this change is gonna happen in their organization. And so he, he went around two different users of the, or these change agents within the ARPANET community because that, that was the network, and recruited a number of, of those change agents, which he called architects of this. And so he created a community of these architects, and this is the first networked user community and the first sort of improvement community of, um, of people who were coming together. They were all charged with um, advancing capability within their own organization. So they started collaborating among themselves on like, well, how are you gonna do that? How are you gonna do that? How did you get your boss to give you more funding for this? And you know, what kind of training are you offering here? And so, you know, really, and they were using NLS to collaborate this way. And then they got to come and have total immersion in the lab. They could come and I think it was every quarter that they were coming and to see what it's like. I mean, that's sort of the end result is that if you, this, is, this is how we could live and work together. We're gonna just sort of piecemeal these capabilities into our organization. So dad called that the um, Knowledge Workshops Architect Community, which is quack. And so <laughs> they had um, every year elected a chairman to this committee and the chairman was called the King Quack. And it was quite an honor to be the King Quack, and they loved being quacks. And, they had, and there was always a, a portion of the meeting where um, the art group was not allowed inside, so they got to have their own private time <clears throat> to discuss among themselves what they would like to see that's different and how, so they became part of the design process in an extended way, and so this is maybe one of the first sort of lean, customer-focused, um, iterative projects um, all done online. And then gradually more users and more networks, uh, TimeNet and other, I can't remember, the, there were networks. How, how many sites were there total? They're all together in the end, there were hundreds. And so, uh, and this is, was all documented by one of the first users from the Romare Development Center, which I used, Dwayne Stone. He ended up writing a history of this. And so, and that's online at the Internet Archive. <laughs> what year was that? Um, so the ARPANET came online, actually that's another story in itself, between this group and UCLA, because this group uh, was tasked to be the network information center for the new network because of the NLS and the interest in information, mm -hmm. um, in information <laughs> services. And UCLA was tasked to be the um, network measurement center. And so those two Ooh. were the first to be brought on. So it was between UCLA and SRI, this group at SRI, to have that first transmission and get it working. Then four, so this is 1969, the end of 1969, there were four sites working. And then it expanded from there. Okay. Um. And I think... So you worked with, and Steve Crocker is here in the room somewhere. Steve Crocker, I think, is here someplace, and Vint Cerf is here. And Vint Cerf. Uh, <laughs> well, and there was another, another colleague named uh, Steve Carr at the University of Utah. And, and we started meeting and talking and arguing, and then eventually we started writing things down, and those memos became the RFCs, and the rest is history. 
Uh, let's see. Um, I, I, um, so I want to make a little closing comment, but anything else before I do that? <clears throat> Did you want to talk at all about the uh, line processor and all we had to do to get it to work through the internet? Yeah, well, by the ARPANET. Let, let me just do it very briefly. So there is a long discussion then about how they actually made this work over the ARPANET. Uh, because what you wanted to do was have the appearance that you saw on the screen with interactive text manipulation and mouse movement and whatnot operating through an extraordinarily low band version zero of what grew up to become the internet. And uh, to do that, they had to build um, gear to go remotely to handle the, the, the interactive processing part. And then the PDP-10s back at the home site would, would actually manipulate the docu documents. This model, I mean, you see it today. This is Gmail, uh, exactly the way that it works. So. Uh, let, me, let me go on. So um, I want to go back to a point that, that Don and Charles talked about a little bit. Uh, I was actually a graduate student all this time. I was in the honors co-op pro program at Stanford, starting work toward my PhD while I was doing all this stuff at SRI. And uh, at that time, the computer science department at Stanford was actually a part of the math department. They weren't even a separate department yet. And Computer science at that level, I mean, most of the computers in the world were doing inventory control, data processing, payroll, that kind of stuff, by far the majority of computers. Computer science was basically numerical analysis, uh, logic, and uh, metamathematics, proving that t Kleine T predicates are equivalent to Turing machines and this kind of stuff. Um, so that was sort of the state of affairs in November of 1968. Bob Taylor, uh, at, in his role at ARPA, was really the manage, sort of an overall manager of, of a lot of the computer science research going on in the country at the time. If you go back and look in ACMs from 1968, I don't know, maybe half the articles are from people that had ARPA sponsorship. And, and so, he had a very good handle on this, and he seeded the audience. He, he, he went to his, all his sites at MIT and CMU and Utah and Champaign-Urbana and UCLA and Santa Barbara and everybody, every place, and had them send people into this audience of 2,000. And uh, we did the demo in December, and then I characterize it as, and in January, we had these evangelists, Taylor had these evangelists that just sort of flipped the bit in computer science from, from this focus on, on mathematics and, and, and metamathematics and logic over, I mean, that was still gonna go on, but the huge flip into computers are really for communication and, and for getting people to work together by communicating, in Doug's case, text, a little tiny bit of graphics and and um, and the video. Okay, so I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.